This was like the kill between the Palestinians. Yeah. Remember that? I remember that. Now, they go into Lebanon and they're doing the same thing. Mm. Look at that. These are the Lebanese... But they're also the destroying Hezbollah. Yeah, but they, at what cost? And the thing is, like, if well, you look, if, point, if, point, if you look at that, remember when I gave you, like, the what is the exchange rate? Yeah. It seems that the best investment that you can do is Israeli souls because they never depreciate. Mm. Israeli souls. Invest in Israeli souls. Given the Hezbollah, it's an oxymoron, right? But given, I don't know if they have but given Hezbollah's response on October the 8th was to start unleashing rockets at Israel, which they carried on doing all year, at what point did they not they expect... Didn't, they didn't unleash rockets at Israel. Mehdi Hassan already told you that. They made it in Shabah form, which... No, he was spitting hairs. What? He was spitting hairs. No, it's, no. Well, okay, but it's land that Israel's claimed to disown since 1967. Yeah. Okay? So they say it's theirs. You know, but well, you know what's the difference? But between, they knew what they were doing. You know what's the difference between Hezbollah and Israel? As well, I'm not a big fan of Hezbollah. Hezbollah always targets military bases. That's not true. They've killed civilians. Yeah, how many? Not as many as Israel. They've but they've killed civilians. They killed 42. So, but the idea, that, yeah, but so the idea they're only how targeting, many is, how they're many, only targeting uh, military. And Israel killed 1,000. 1,000 for 42. Mm. That's like a 1 to 20. But they've also targeted thousands of Hezbollah very precisely with these pages. And then they killed 1,000 people. Right. Yeah. That's just a small taste of the mental gymnastics Pierce Morgan deployed to justify and both sides Israel's war crimes. And even when Bassem got him to concede particular points, he still found a way to engage in whataboutism or rationalize Israel's barbaric behavior or deflect and obfuscate. And it was genuinely frustrating, as these Pierce Morgan debates always are. But here's the thing. I genuinely do not think that Pierce Morgan cares about this issue either way. He engages in these debates about the supposed complexity of genocide as if it's so complex because he wants to make money, right? Even though he gets humiliated by his guests, he's more than happy to subject himself to that embarrassment because he gets a lot of views and clicks. So he is a grifter, and that actually came up in this interview. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about the tactics that Pierce Morgan uses, because I think that this is a good demonstration of how bad faith tactics can be dismantled pretty easily. And all that Bossom has to do is supply viewers with a little bit of information and more importantly, with context. So as you saw, Bassam shared those graphs that make it very clear that we're not talking about quote-unquote wars as it relates to Gaza and now Lebanon. Both sides are not equal here. We're talking about a powerful military backed by the United States government disregarding international law and indiscriminately slaughtering innocent civilians. But Pierce Morgan suggested that that's all fine because they're taking out militants. So if some collateral damage, as they'd say happens in the process, well, that's just the cost of war. But it doesn't work that way, okay? Yes, everyone acknowledges that civilian casualties happen in wars, but it's not that it's happening on accident. Israel is doing this on purpose, and their justification lends insight into the fact that they're doing that because they keep saying, oh, we had to kill these civilians because... You know, Hamas was using them as human shields or Hezbollah has been using them as human shields. But think about it this way. If a bank robber took a dozen hostages, would you think it was acceptable to just blow up the entire bank and then justify it by accusing the bank robber of taking the teller and everybody in the bank as human shields? Of course not. But that's essentially what Israel does again and again and again. And Pierce Morgan is still going along with it. And when he's backed into a corner after defending what is obviously indefensible, he then points the finger and plays whataboutism. Listen, for all this talk about terrorism, why is it that Israel kills more civilians than Hamas and Hezbollah overall, but yet they're never considered terrorists? Nobody who's defending Israel's barbarism is asked whether or not they condemn the IDF. It's a double standard, and it's just so disingenuous to see, right? What Israel does is characterized as self-defense always by people like Pierce Morgan. But on the subject of Lebanon, Pierce Morgan ended up walking right into a trap that he set for himself, and he accidentally ended up making a case against collective punishment, which Bassem predictably seized on. So let's see how that went. A lot of people I know in the Lebanon do not agree with yes, that Yes, I understand. But a they lot think of, Hezbollah has been a very insidious but, 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 influence on that of country. Of course. But like even those people who hate Hezbollah, they don't like what Israel is doing to them. But what is it? About 30% of people in Lebanon support Hezbollah. 70% don't. I don't have these numbers. The two-thirds of the country don't support them. Yes. They don't represent... 
I, people. I, oh, good. So they don't represent the people, and yet you're killing people around Hezbollah, even if they don't represent them. So why? Well, they're killing, in their eyes, they're killing terrorists. Well, in their eyes, they're doing whatever. In their eyes, they were thinking that whatever school that they bombed in Egypt was inside the military base. Do you accept, and, as we've been talking, though, that it is complicated? It's not simple. No, it's not really complicated. It's, there is an occupation that should end. If the occupation didn't happen, all of that wouldn't have happened. And that right there is such an important point by Bassem, but we're going to come back to that. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but Pierre didn't really have a way to respond to the fact that Israel is indeed collectively punishing civilians in Lebanon for the actions of Hezbollah. And in order to try to get out of the corner that he backed himself into, did you see what he did? He played the Uno reverse card that he always has in his back pocket. He nuanced trolled. Okay, I hear what you're saying, Bassam, but you know, isn't it a little bit more complicated? No, it's not. It's only complicated when you strip away the context and view the situation in a vacuum. But the reason why Bassam is such an effective communicator is because he provides viewers with the context that Pierce Morgan doesn't give them. So when Pierce tries to obfuscate, Bassam brings clarity to the situation. For example, Pierce makes it seem like all of these militant groups inexplicably materialized out of thin air for no reason whatsoever aside from just pure hatred of the state of Israel. But the world isn't black and white like that. And when you try to build a country on top of another country, there's going to be problems with that. This isn't shocking. Settler colonialism isn't some abstract or complex phenomenon. It is happening now and it's happened forever. Most of us watching this video live in a country that had people living here before we chose to come over and committed a genocide. So this isn't some new thing that we're dealing with here. We're seeing history repeat itself in a vicious and violent way. And Bassam offered that perspective to Pierce Morgan. So let's watch. Do you see any blame on your side for any of this going back to 1948? Yeah, I think the Palestinians had done a grave mistake for not accepting the settlement that they were given by the UN partition. I mean, they were given 47% of their land. And uh, uh, I mean, let's go back. Uh, the Belfort Declaration was 1917. At the time, there were 60,000 Jewish people living in a 700,000 uh, population, which makes them 8%. That number jumped from 8% to 30% after the Second World War and the Holocaust. Now, Imagine yourself being a Palestinian, you're having all of these refugees coming to you, and then they're forming gangs and stealing your land and killing you. And then the UN said, like, I know what we can do. I'm going to give the people who just arrived 30 years ago 53 of the land, and I'm going to give the people who are already there, who form 70%, 47. What he did there was very clever, in my opinion, because he's trying to prime people to think about this from an American or British perspective, so that way it's more relatable to them. And the reason why it's so difficult for Americans and people in the West to put themselves in the shoes of people in Palestine or Lebanon is because we often don't hear that perspective in mainstream media. But to expand on what Bassam was saying, let me make it more relevant to people who at least live in the United States. So a month ago, Republicans were all up in arms about Venezuelan gangs supposedly taking over apartment complexes in Aurora, Colorado. Remember that? There was also the story of Haitians supposedly eating people's pets in Springfield, Ohio. Turns out both of those stories were complete bullshit. Fabricated. Hoaxes. And the uh, Haitians eating people's pets lie was actually conjured up by neo-Nazis. But that's besides the point. So many Americans believed these stories, and they were already primed to believe these types of lies about immigrants due to hysteria about immigration and sensationalized stories about migrant crime, which is a red herring since immigrants statistically commit less crime than citizens. But regardless, it's to the point where 47% of Americans support a Gestapo-like force rounding up immigrants and placing them in military camps. So... Our country, the current climate, is deeply, deeply xenophobic, even though undocumented immigrants only account for less than 4% of the entire population. But that 4% is enough to work Americans up into a frenzy to the point where they support violence against these people. Now, ask yourself how Americans would react if some external entity came in and said, those immigrants that you're so afraid of, they're going to take control of half of all U.S. territory, and they're going to form their own government within our borders. Do you think that Americans would take kindly to that? 
I don't think that would go too well. It would trigger an all-out bloody war. Now, fast forward a couple of decades after this hypothetical resettlement of immigrants. What if these immigrants started to expand the territory that they were given and they started to take over portions of Texas and then they took over half of Louisiana and then they started bulldozing homes in Mississippi and evicting people who've lived there their whole lives? Do you think that Americans would just throw their hands up and say, well, you know, there's nothing you can do in the face of forced eviction and displacement? Do you think they just accept that? Of course not. We'd have like 33 different versions of Hamas if that were to happen to us. We know that Americans would not tolerate what they expect Palestinians to tolerate because think of how fickle Americans already are. I mean, we have a large portion of the population that believes in the white supremacist great replacement conspiracy theory, and they unironically believe that diversity alone is tantamount to a genocide against white people. So you bet your ass, if Americans were in the same situation as Palestinians were in, they wouldn't be happy about the situation, to put it mildly. And they would welcome militias from Canada and other countries in the event they also wanted to help take back our land before their land gets taken over next. So I say all this to say Americans would do the same thing if they were in the situation Palestinians were in. They're not uniquely violent or anti-Semitic. Children in Gaza are growing up in the world's largest open-air prison, and some are going to respond to the violent conditions that have been imposed on them with violence, especially if they lost their home or had family members killed by the occupying force. It's basic cause and effect. And Basim is trying to give people an understanding as to why there's so much quote-unquote tension in the region. He's not justifying violence against Israeli civilians, but he's trying to explain why the situation is as volatile as it is. The context is crucial. But here's another question. What should Palestinians do to push back against the occupation? Because we all know that occupation is not okay, and Palestinians have a right to resist occupation. But what do they do? Because violence is obviously condemned, but when they try to resist peacefully, well, they get punished for that too. And that's what Basim is going to explain in this next clip that I think is really, really powerful. We always ask what Israel should do, but we never ask what should the Palestinians do. Because, I mean, I know that there is like really great examples. I mean, there are some peaceful examples. There's a beautiful boy called Mido. He's 19 years old. He was an ex he's an exchange student in Texas. And uh, he was moved from one safe zone to the other, and he ended up into a safe zone, and he was farming. He had a beautiful, beautiful garden. And he was farming, and he was blogging about it. His mom died with, uh, because of lack of medicine, but he continued to farm. And you know what happened to him? He was killed in an airstrike. Mm. You asked me about the Nelson Mandela, and there's a woman called Ahmed Abu Trema. He was, he was inspired by the civil rights movements and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and he toured the churches and the schools and the colleges in the United mm. States, and he came back, and Israel hit him in an airstrike, killing five of his family, including his son, and he was injured. Mm. Uh, if, if Palestinians march, they, they get killed. If they throw a stone at a, a tank, they get killed. If they, if they sit at home quietly, someone will come in and take their home away and they kill them. If someone just like picking up all of that, they will kill them. So what would that is, and, and I don't know, like- are, But it is, sounds to me like what you're doing, you're constructing- That's like I'm justifying October 7th, right? No, I, I'm gonna put words in your mouth, but mm. it sounds to me like you're saying, what else did you expect? Yeah, what else did you expect? If you treat people like animals, they will behave like animals, Pierce. And that's a problem. There's this expectation that Palestinians are just supposed to Shut up and take it. Accept perpetual occupation. Accept that Israel controls their food supply, their water in Gaza, in the West Bank. Just accept this unending system of apartheid where you have different roads that you can walk on depending on if you're Israeli or Palestinian. Just accept it forever and shut up about it. It's clear that no form of resistance is acceptable. Even symbolic resistance in the form of a poem is seen as a threat to Israel's apartheid regime because the IDF murdered Gazan poet Rafat al arir when he was not a violent man. He famously said he didn't have a weapon, but he would defend himself with a pen if the IDF barged into his home because as an academic, a pen was the closest thing that he had to a weapon. But they killed him. He was not a violent person, but they killed him because his words were viewed as a threat as well. 
Why? Because words have the power to change minds. And that's a form of resistance. No form of resistance is permissible to Israel. Again, they're supposed to shut up and accept it forever. Now, since we're talking about Rafat, I'd be remiss to not read you his poem because even though they killed Rafat, they can't kill the ideas that he stood for. So let me read it to you. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it white with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying up above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there, bringing back love. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. This is one of thousands of innocent civilians that has been slaughtered under the pretense of self-defense from Israel. And this is not an isolated incident, as Bassem is going to explain. I don't understand if, for example, Macron would announce that he will uh, for, uh, impose an embargo in Israel's mm -hmm. arms, and then Israel goes and bombs the French oil facilities in Lebanon. How is that defending themselves? Uh, I don't, there's like a group of American doctors who were in Gaza and came back and they reported seeing tens of children with sniper shots in their heads and necks. How is that defending themselves? Just a couple of days ago, we saw a little kid being shot by a drone. His family came to, to, for, to, him, to help him and then they were all killed. How is that defending itself? I mean, I hear it, but uh, I, I, I just don't see it. Yeah, it's because it's not self-defense. It's a genocide. And even if you were stupid enough to believe that this was about self-defense, ask yourself, why is this still going on even though Israel has taken out the leadership of Hamas and Hezbollah? There's still no end in sight. Israel's minister of defense, Yoav Galand, tweeted that they're going to remain in Gaza for years after they announced that they killed Yahya Sinwar. But this is self-defense, according to Piers Morgan. But... Let's end on a lighter note because this has been pretty depressing. But let's talk about Pierce Morgan being a grifter, as I promised. So Pierce Morgan actually confronted Bassem Youssef for basically calling him a grifter on another show. And Bassem actually tries to downplay it a little bit. But Pierce was pretty defensive because I think that Bassem's words cut pretty deep because he knows deep down it's spot on. You've been critical of me saying, I only do what I do because... I'm after clicks, I'm after... I never said that about you. You did? No. No, you did. When? We found it. Where? Um, let me find that clip. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I... Uh, not I, clip, I, no, it's, it's an interview. Hey, where is it? Oh, OK. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, so you said this. Yeah, yeah. You said at the Arab Media Forum in June. I don't know why people mm. care that Piers Morgan changes his opinion. Yes. He's a man who seeks trends and increasing viewership. It's true. Yes. As he hosts people and sits with them to raise viewership numbers. Yes. His opinion isn't important at all because he only, only cares about what is trending and what people will talk about. Yes. So it doesn't matter that he changed his opinion. Mm -hmm. Piers is a man who has a media platform on which we appear to convey our ideas to his viewers, nothing more. And there's um, nothing wrong with that. By the way, that's your job, actually, to uh, get clicks and views. Because no, but, there, I mean, the question I was asked is, what do you think of, but the implication of what does he be, Does he change your mind? And I said, like, I don't care about him changing I understand that. But because what, that's the, your job. But the implication of what you were saying was that that's all I care about. And I don't actually care about what I genuinely care about, which is trying to work out what the world should think about this. Mm -hmm. What is the correct proportion of response from either side to any of the things that have happened? And it is, I think it is morally complex. You find it morally more straightforward. Mm -hmm. I find it complicated. Bullshit. You are pretending to find it complicated and you're going out of your way to nuance troll because you know it's more profitable to ride the fence than to go all in on either side. There's a reason why Dave Rubin and Jimmy Dore were more relevant when they were pretending to be liberal while spreading right wing talking points, because it's not interesting to see a conservative say conservative things. That's a dime a dozen. Right. But it is interesting to see what the liberal has to say. That sounds conservative. Well, if this liberal is saying it, well, it seems a little bit more legitimate. And more importantly, it's more profitable to that person to spout that right-wing propaganda. So that's why Piers will never, ever pick a side and is perpetually confused and on the fence about this particular issue. It's because he's a grifter. And listen, 
at least he's elevating alternative voices, which is more than you can say about most of the people in his sphere. But let's not pretend that he's a curious person trying to tackle difficult philosophical questions about a genocide. That is not what he's doing. Now, you can argue that there's still value in this type of content, but let's not pretend it's a labor of love for him because he doesn't give a shit. He's doing this for the money, which is gross because I, for one, wouldn't both sides of genocide no matter how much money I was getting, but I guess that's why he's there and I'm here and why he's rich and I'm not. So we'll leave that there. Bassem Yusuf is once again showing us how to simplify supposedly complicated geopolitical issues. All you need to do is add a little bit of context and statistics and the rest is history.